Um, good afternoon, everybody. Um, we are at the end of this conference. I cannot believe it. I just say to um, say to Nika that uh, time flies when you're having fun. And uh, thank you so much for being able to record this because I think a lot of people go and listen to this afterwards. And I almost wish the caliber of people that's here um, this afternoon, you know, that everybody can listen to it. So thank you very much, Andrea, for your insights. Um, she's from PwC South Africa and heading up the, the family business unit. And she did the report with Skulk. Um, I had the privilege of getting to know both of them the last couple of years. So thank you so much, Andrea. Also a new Pleasure. wife. So thank you, Del, yeah. you, thank you for allowing me to join us this afternoon. And then the next person I want to introduce, a uh, long CV, but um, Phyllis, if I can call you that for now, I had to write out the the uh, abbreviation of your company, but I don't know who of you watched the Bourne uh, movie series, so yeah. I will never forget your, your company, but uh, she's from Ghana. And they, I find uh, Ghanaians uh, always very, very um, friendly people. Uh, our students from Ghana are very friendly and warm. And uh, she is the founder of Born Global Estate and Investments. Um, I hope I pronounce it correctly. It's a yes, family owned right. company. And it's actually a multi-venture uh, family enterprise. And she's operating already on three continents. And I'm sure soon... Uh, that will increase, but it's already a huge thing to operate in three continents. But what I like most about her uh, bio is that she's passionate about stewardship, which I think is very important for our discussion this afternoon. And she's also passionate about leaving a legacy and legacy building. And Nika, that um, you know, latches on to very much to your presentation um, earlier with Shelley in terms of the book that you wrote. Um, it was also about legacy. And I, I, I ask you, what do you see um, as a legacy? So uh, before I start with the more formal questions, um, can I perhaps ask, um, Nika, I've already asked you, but perhaps I can ask Phyllis before I come um, to more specific questions. Phyllis, what do you see as a legacy? You're passionate about legacy training and building. And, and what do you see as a legacy? And perhaps, Nika, you can just repeat what you have said in, in, uh, in the question that I've asked you. So, and Andrew, you're welcome also to respond afterwards if you have something to add. But Phyllis, if we can start with you, what, what do you see I, as a legacy? I actually agree with what Nikkei has defined, but I also see as legacy as the life you're living now. It's not, it's not about something you're leaving behind. It's something you're creating now that the next generation is going to um, see and use and um, want to be something you want to be remembered for but the next generation as you are creating it they are taking the wisdom the values from it that they can also um, create their own legacy with so it carries on through generations and it's up to um the next generations and the next generations to keep it going. That's what I see a legacy is. Yeah. That is such a wonderful answer. And I know you also have three kids, yes, I uh, children. And I think, um, you know, I've just um, done that book, uh, Wealth of Management, Wealth Management of uh, Wealthy Families. And they say exactly the same. It's at the end of the day about parenthood. And it's monkey see, monkey do. You cannot tell your children to save and be wise with money, but then you don't do it. So if you um, are a steward of your business, the chances are very good. That, uh, that, so yo, that is a very powerful um, description. Nika, I don't know if you and Andrea want to add to that. Yeah, I'll just repeat what I said in the last session. Um, for those that weren't there, um, my favorite definition is by Peter Stroppel. Legacy is not leaving something for people, it's leaving something in people. So I echo what Phyllis is saying. It really is about passing down 
this entrepreneurial legacy, leaving them with the know-how to be able to create value across generations where family members are able to reflect on like their collective wisdom, knowledge, intelligence, and reflect on their triumphs and trials in the past and look at how they can rebuild um, and accumulate resilience for the future. Um, what you said about it being um, here and now, not just a future kind of event, really resonates. And something I often say to my clients is, what's the legacy you want to be living, not just the legacy you want to be leaving? So what's our collective legacy now that we're building together as a family? Um, and that can live out in the business or philanthropy, social impact, in the family, in different avenues. But I definitely agree with you, um, Elmarie, it's about parenting. Mm, yeah, yeah. Andrea, something you want to add to that? What 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 have you experienced with your clients in terms of legacy? Um, for them, it's usually uh what they want to be remembered for. Um, and if you think about what will stand on the gravestone, <laughs> but that's very looking into the past. Uh, so I also believe in the year and the now. Like, what are you doing now? Um, and instilling now in in your your children um in your employees in the in the communities uh that's very important yeah um i can perhaps just also mention we have heard the word social emotional wealth now several times yesterday and today and one of the dimensions or aspects of social emotional wealth is for family businesses because they have a long-term orientation is to leave a legacy but also reputation, you know, families don't like to have uh, a bad name. And I think it's the same for, you know, parents. Um, so that's why I say, you know, what do we want to leave for our children? Um, you know, so that they see the example. So Andrew, perhaps I can start this question with you and then goes to Phyllis and then to Nikkei. So what do you experience? You now um, relayed a lot of positive things about the next gen to us uh, in your survey. But what do you find the, the youth, the next gen is grappling with? What are the challenges that they're grappling with in Africa? Um, have you picked up what challenges? So if I can start with you, then Phyllis and then Nikkei, please. Um, some of the businesses in Africa that I'm working with um, and it really differs from from um country to country. For instance, where I work with a family in Cameroon, there's extremely important the hierarchy. Uh, so sometimes they're afraid to take the ideas. Uh, they're afraid to speak up. They're afraid to lead, um, because they want to follow example and you know respect the elders. Uh, I think in South Africa they are more, you know, they they're not as afraid to speak up. Yeah. Uh, but but the main challenge still is for the the elders to to pass the baton to them, and how do they prove themselves, and how do they uh you know show themselves as worthy uh to take the business forward? That's one of the main challenges that I see. Phyllis and you? Yeah, um, I I agree with everything Andrea just said. Um, of course, one of the um add-ons to that is that the they they want autonomy they want to they want to feel that um their parents believe in them that they are capable and and doing it without stepping on the parents toes especially where you have parents who are not ready to let go um how to communicate that without being disrespectful because, of course, as we've just said, in, in the African context, um, respecting your elders has a particular meaning. In certain instances, it's about not even speaking back to them when mm. um, you, you can't communicate what you really want or, or what you're feeling uh, without speaking back. But sometimes in speaking back, it's considered, um, you know, uh, disrespectful. So that, that's a big challenge that I, I, I know um, a lot of the next gens are going through. In terms that is of a very good um, uh, remark because I don't also like it if my children speak back. 
um, you know, and and the big problem is, um, Phyllis, to to um support what you're saying is that um the generations differ so much, uh, you know, and it's not always seen as disrespect the way that they act. It's just a characteristic of the current generation. And uh, I think that is why we also should educate ourselves. I see it in my students, mm -hmm. you know, there's also a generational gap. And unless you understand how that generation thinks, uh, if you can get to that point, it makes it so much easier not to take it personally, but also yeah. to have a better understanding of how to react. So very good um, point. Uh, Nika, uh, your view, take on that. What do you experience as challenges? Um, Andrea and um, Phyllis have said them both um, really apt. Those are a lot of my clients grapple with those challenges. In addition, um, a number of them feel conflicted between spending their time in the family enterprise and carrying on, on the legacy or pursuing their own path and feeling torn. Do I have to choose one? Um, can I do both? if I can, just feeling a sense of overwhelm. Um, and another challenge that I frequently see is a lot of my clients are female. So, yeah. and um, grappling with, I don't lead in a very authoritarian way. How can I lead in a natural way that's um, that really resonates with who I am and resonates with my values? And does that have space in this very male dominated environment? Quite a lot of my clients are in construction or manufacturing or heavy industry. Um, you know, can I be a servant leader in such an environment where my granddad or my dad led in a very different manner? Um, those are the challenges that I find that next gens frequently grapple with. Oh, it's so interesting. Phyllis, um, perhaps Elmer... it's... Sorry, um, Andrea, yes. No, maybe Please. if I can just add another one that came to mind now, um, especially with the, the current generation who focuses more on work-life balance. Uh, I've seen that that some of the family members, you know, it's extremely hard work and it's blood, sweat and tears. And if you're in your own family business, you usually go above and beyond. It's not just a paycheck. It's not just the eight to five. And that the spouses don't always understand that because yeah. if they have to work those hours or, you know, go through things like that, they'll just say, no, I'm just going to leave the company and move on to another one where I've better work-life balance. Mm -hmm. yeah. um, where if you live and breathe the family business and you, obviously you, mm -hmm. you were brought up to believe in the legacy and that you're giving this and you're being a custodian for the next generation of the business, um, they don't always understand that. So that's also what I've, what I've mm -hmm. seen quite a bit. That is a good remark because I see it with my clients. I just uh, two days back spoke to a client in KwaZulu Natal, and it's exactly this that issue. Um, yeah, it's exactly that issue. It's um, amazing. There was so much family harmony, and now both sons got married. And yeah, the yeah, let's it's say the balance dynamics. is uh, disturbed. <laughs> <laughs> Phyllis, can I please ask, start this question with you and then go to Nika and then to Andrea. Um, we talk a lot about the next generation, but what can the current older generation do to make sure that the next generation are raised as stewards? And perhaps for those of, of us that's not perhaps so um, well known with stewardship, what what do you mean by that? What do, what I know you say you're passionate about stewardship and mm -hmm. and how can the older generation install that and what does it mean? Well, stewardship <clears throat> that's a, a great question. Um, stewardship essentially um, for me is learning to be a custodian of whatever. Um, the legacy or the assets or whatever it is that you have inherited or the, the, your parents pass on to you. And knowing that you are just a trustee of what has been left to you and it is for you to um, receive it, add value to it, make it better so that it passes on through the generations whether it's passing on through the generations in terms of your own family or through the generations as a legacy to the community, you have a responsibility to pass it on 
better than you received it. And so that's what stewardship is about. You are you have oversight of it, but you don't. It's not yours to use and mm -hmm. uh, and and just this what use and abuse, if I can say, <laughs> uh, mm -hmm. as you 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 are you are basically uh, a trustee of of the assets. Yeah. And and what can the older generation or the current generation do to almost educate the younger generation mm -hmm. to do that? Well, um, if I take my my own family, for instance, um, as I said, I am a next gen and I am uh, educating next gens as well in terms of my kids. And I think um, the older generation have that responsibility, of course, to live what they want the next gen to see and do and to tell the story, to tell the story, not just telling the story, but telling the story in terms of the struggles, why it is that it is important to keep, um, the, keep, keep the asset or legacy going, why it is they started the business in the first place. It may not be the same reason that the next gen will continue it, but having learned about the struggles, having seen um, the, the, the work that went into it to build whatever it is that the family has built, whether it's real estate, whether it's a business, whether it's even just transferring the wisdom in, in, in um, what they have learned and pass, passing on to them, that is really important. And I think um, when when you tell the story and you're able to um, show the emotional side of it, what it means to you, it resonates in a lot of times, it resonates with the next gen in terms of the life they're living. There comes a time when those stories and those values that you have um, uh, expressed in actual telling a story that uh, explains why you build the business, explain, explains why certain aspects are important to you and to the family, it then resonates with them and they come to realize, I think it's really important to vocalize what you want them to have and sit and tell the story whilst you're alive. Um, I, I, so, I say that I say that primarily because um, when my father died, there was a, a lot that we didn't know. We didn't mm -hmm. know about him. We didn't know about his father or his his parents. I had to then talk to my mother, who knew what she knew from the time she met him, and so I unpacked a lot of that, and then started mm -hmm. writing about it, and then pass it on to my my kids and I think it's it's been really valuable to them uh, being able to do that so I think that's something most parents should do or the next the now gen mm -hmm. should be able to do that and, and and leave that as a legacy too that is very good advice and um you know one of our previous speakers this morning and of yesterday Phyllis um and, and we see that more and more in our research is the importance of storytelling. And um, um, somebody said it, but that's also a task that you perhaps can give the older generation is to go then and document, um, you know, exactly. the stuff or uh, give it to an in-law because um, I have a family, you know, we, uh, the, the, one of the in-laws studied history and uh, we task her now with writing up the story because I think you get a lot more insight if you talk and you give people pers perspectives. Um, and Nika, isn't that also a challenge, um, you know, for the next gen is that often the in-laws come in and they see the wealth, but they don't see, they don't understand the story that's behind the wealth and the hard work and the sweat and the tears. So what do you see as uh, you also, uh, you know, come from, uh, you know, uh, being taught as a next gen, but one of these days your kids will also be grown up. So 
What do you think the older generation, what would you have liked to have seen your parents do more mm -hmm. to educate you in terms of the future and stewardship? Yeah, I guess I'm similar to Phyllis in that I am a next gen and raising a next gen. And I can imagine as a founder, when you're in the early stages of the business, you probably don't foresee that the business would be that successful and last mm -hmm. for that long. And so your your kind of mindset is very separate. So there's business and then there's family, but I have a more kind of um holistic um view of the whole thing now. And um, Raymond has put it in the chat book legacy is about parenting yeah I do see it as about parenting because it starts from a young age from um, really trying to articulate to the family uh, what are our values and embodying them in behaviors and showing them to the rising generation we believe in service or we believe in love we, we right. believe we have a responsibility to the environment or to the community mm -hmm. and demonstrating that through action so they can start to um, embody it themselves and also developing skills so it's not just the soft stuff i think there's a lot of hard skills required as uh, to be an effective steward to be entrusted with assets that you're keeping for on behalf of future descendants that you may not get to see requires that you understand how an asset is performing, how to measure that, you know. So it requires personal finance skills. It requires being able to understand business broadly, just business strategy, um, you know, the role of governance. And obviously you have to make this age appropriate. So my kids are seven and four. We have conversations on the value of money. Mummy and daddy have to work to make money. So you can buy all these things you think just, we just pluck the money off a tree. It doesn't work that way. <laughs> and we have conversations about piggy banks. Um, so yeah. if I put a hundred coins in this piggy bank um, and it costs 20 to spend on this game, is it worth it? You don't need to be left with 80. What are we going to do with the remaining 80? Um, you have to save, you have to invest. And we have age appropriate conversations on personal finance, on our values, on um, why we are very passionate about philanthropy and getting involved in the community. Yeah. So I think that's something that um, the now gen can do to raise effective stewards. And obviously you, over time, um, when they're teenagers, that will change when they're in their 20s and their 30s, that will change. But I do believe it starts from when they're able to go to school and learn ABCs, they're able to learn what money is and the value of money, yeah. Oh, very good. Andrea, can I ask this question for you first? Um, in your survey, what were some of the top priorities uh, for the next gen? And um, did you find there's a difference? Um, and perhaps you can give us some examples. And then Nikkei, also perhaps you and Phyllis afterwards, you know, um, can you give us examples of where priorities between the older and the next generation differ? And, and how should that be handled? So Andrea, perhaps we can start with you and to give us some insights uh, because I think you have done surveys on both generations. So what are some of the top priorities for the next gen? And do you find that those, some of these priorities differ from the current generation? So as mentioned in, in the previous session, um, two thirds of the, the next gens that we surveyed said growth. All they focusing on growth. However we do it, we need to grow, expand into new markets, focus on your products and services. Um, that is that is their very big focus and, and it, it aligns with the current gen. And um, so that's where we said it's actually amazing that they're so similar in thinking and they're so aligned at the moment. The only thing uh, that we saw I uh, didn't align was the focus on impact investing um, on things like philanthropy and giving back to the communities. It was a priority for, for the current gen. It's not like it's not a priority, uh, but it was just higher on their priority list for, for, the, for the next gen. I think because they also grew up and um, or are more focused on and, and they have to think about the, the problems of today. So where are we? What are we doing with regards to ESG? We have to make sure that we have a business in the next 20, 30, 40, 50 years um, you know, going forward, for instance, Europe, they already require you need to be green. Um, and, and that's just going to be 
become more and more important. Um, you know, certain places they won't invest or they won't support your products if it's not green or um, if you don't have the proper governance in place or if you don't look after your staff. Um, so, for instance, the, the social, you know, um, equal pay and um, gender equality and all those type of social um, topics uh, the now Jane needs to focus on or, or the next gen needs to focus on. Um, so I think I think that's why it's more of a focus for them than than the current gen. And you, Nikkei? Yeah, you that's... Some, you find there's a gap in priorities? Oh, I, everything Andrea said definitely resonates. The next gen and the now gen, in my experience, tend to be aligned on the growth. Um, now, where I see an opportunity for some improvement is that the now gen typically may have just one business, two business. It's not very complicated. But when the next gen then come in and start saying, we need to expand here, we need to set up a new division here, we need to invest here, it creates a more complicated structure. And that's leads to the conversation on we may need a family office, but also needs to the conversation on the skill set of the ne next gen. Um, so they may need more sophisticated business acumen. So um, going to, for an MBA may be necessary at this point. Whereas in the prior gen, you may have seen um, a parent that wasn't necessarily skilled or trained in business per se, but was like an instinctive entrepreneur. Um, and with your point on um, the push for sustainability and ESG is definitely something I'm seeing as well, where the next gen are expecting that we don't want to see philanthropy over here and we don't want to see our business over here. We want it to be holistic. We want to see that the business is sustainable in, in and of itself and is having some impact on local community, is purposeful, is looking after the planet and so on and so forth. And I think um there lies an opportunity to kind of negotiate amongst the generation what works on both sides of the table um because we're seeing in the industry that it really is the sustainability theme that's engaging the next generation it's something they're really keen on so if i were a now gen i'd be um just be willing to kind of explore how that can look with the next gen because the, their engagement is really important. Mm. And and Andrea, um, uh, I want to ask you then a, a, a specific question. Do you find that upskilling was uh, on the next generation's agenda? And uh, Nika now talked about you know getting something like an MBA. What what are favorite educational paths for the next gen? Did you find did you do um, uh, investigated that in your study? Um, yes, we did. So just under half of them said they actually want to upskill and reskill and um, go back to school, um, study part time. And uh, I think uh, the next gen understands that going forward, you're going to have to constantly reskill um, because the information and everything changes so quickly. And for you to stay yeah. on top of it, you would need to, uh, you know, add to your skill set. So what we've seen with some of the, the main things that they study um, is business model innovation, uh, finance and investment, leadership development. So focusing on the soft skills, um, that that was a top three. That's interesting. And Phyllis, perhaps uh, you have the most wisdom um, be, uh, sitting in a multi-generational okay. family business and being a mother and coming from an, another generation, um, what would you see as good mentoring parts? If if you know parent listening to, I almost want to say like Shelly, like listening to the show because it feels like a show. Uh, if you're listening to this program, this talk, um, what 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 would you see as um, important paths for the older generation, current generation um, to do. Because if I can just mention something, um, when I talk to indigenous African family business leaders, um, and, and Nika, you also sit in that position, but their children go and they even study abroad, you know, now they come back to an African um, culture, 
uh, a business that's situated in Africa, uh, where there's often many other cultural values. How do you handle that? Um, because that's something that fascinates me. It's it's difficult because I think the next gen is much more more educated than we perhaps was. So how do you handle that, Phyllis? Um, yeah, that's a difficult question. But how? Yeah. What, what's your wisdom on that? That's a, a very interesting question, and um, I actually take it from my own standpoint, and I'm sure Nikki this has the same, because. Um, being born in Ghana and my parents having built the business in Ghana, I was educated all over the place and outside of Ghana. And then when I came back um, in 2010, when my father had passed away and the business wasn't going the way it should go, um, my, my mom had invited me to help with the business uh, turn things around but um, for me uh, dealing with the whole the, the cultural differences I had to take a step back in, in mm. reminding myself of the culture that I was in and I grew up in to a point and then left acquired mm. all, all different cultures as well and perspectives and then um, wanting to apply it. So in terms of how to, how to deal with, yeah, it, 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 it's, it's you, you're basically having to understand what the, um, the, the parent generation, the senior generation, um, why they built the business and what they want, what their values are and what they want business to um, represent and also be able to communicate to them what why you think things can be different but you have to do it in a way where you are proving yourself you're demonstrating to them that you can do it they want proof because they're not ready immediately to just let you get in and dismantle in their minds you're just going to dismantle everything they've done and that's their hard work and it means a lot to them so yeah it's about demonstrating to them that you have additional value to bring and in <clears throat> allowing them to hear what you have to say show them what you can do um, and not just show them on paper because they're not really that way inclined. You have to do do some legwork and hard work and show um, through actually solving a problem that exists at the time for them and they get to trust you. And that's one of the things that I think they can then feel comfortable and um you know, I, I don't know if I'm answering the question. Yeah, no, definitely. It's a it's a hard question because I think I don't know, uh, Nikkei, uh, you sit in the same position. Um, would you like to comment on that? Yes, a lot of what Phyllis said really resonates. Um, a huge piece that I had to deal with was coming back from the UK. I kind of had a very arrogant kind of mindset. Like I knew it all. Um, because I was educated in London and I'd worked in this amazing firm and it was very off-putting naturally for both the staff and my, my parents and there had to be a kind of humility to understand, mm -hmm. really learn the system because I was an immigrant for all intents and purposes, I was British. Um, I had to understand the context, um, the culture, the business culture, the business itself and it was like what you were saying, Phyllis, uh, was until I was able to start bringing context specific ideas mm -hmm. that I was able to win over my parents and the, the, the wider stakeholders. And then it was like, oh, OK, they appreciated the outside right. perspective and the outside experiences. I think it goes both ways, though. I think the responsibility cannot be solely on the next generation's kind of. Mm -hmm 
way through this cultural clashes. I think the, the now gen also should be patient and understand that your children are multicultural and they will see things in a different way. Um, and change is not necessarily bad. Um, an outside perspective can be a good thing. Um, quite often the next generation bring with them a global network as well as a global view, view, viewpoint, right? Um, I'm able to tap into my alumni network, other family businesses in different, you know, similar industries with different geographies and learn from them. I'm able to tap into the YPO network and add considerable value um, in terms of ideas that we can implement in the family, in our government governance system, and even contacts um, to push us on our strategic legacy journey. So I think it goes both ways, but on the next gen side is to uh, humility is always a good thing. I, I you take the words right off my mouth because um I think it's the same for us in academia, you know. Um I sometimes think seriously, we have done this 10 years back and wrote a book on this, and now you jump jumping on the bandwagon. But my role models are are consultants in academia that's that knows a lot more than I know. But that is so, uh, you know, the humility is all over their life. And um, that is when you learn, you know. And um, I really also have that belief that the more you are willing to share, the more you learn. And, you know, it's a win-win. I think when you start keeping um, your wisdom to yourself, um, and that is that is um, the wonderful experience that I had with Andrea and them. You know, I always say to her, no, she can she can teach the same that I've been, you know, working with them in PwC. You know, but it's a osmosis. You know, we learn from other people all the time. And I think, like Phyllis said, uh, it also hits me. It's about open communication. You know, it's uh, I think one can get a lot uh, or far when you're transparent. Um, and when you, yeah, when you have integrity. Um, I would very much like um, to have some, uh, uh, I'm going to ask you one more question and then I would like to open the floor because I see there's some messages coming through. So um, perhaps um, starting with you, Phyllis, and then Andrea and then Nikkei, what can the next generation do to diversify? Um, Andrea said growth is important to the next generation, but Phyllis, what can they do to diversify uh, the, the family business? Okay, well, it of course depends on the family business and where it is going, where, where the, the goal that has been set. But I also believe that it, it, be, it depends on what the interest and the career path of the next generation within the family um, is because at times um, there may be a particular um, industry that the business is in to start with, but they are um, the the as I think Nikkei mentioned the um, now generation uh, are not ready um, for the most part to diversify in too many areas. Now, the next generation having, um, uh, having grown into a particular career path, for instance, I, I, I just come back to always using my family because it's, it's the, the easiest for me. But my kids, for instance, have gone into, um, uh, one is in engineering, naturopathic medicine, and then real estate. And the business I started, for instance, is in real estate. My parents, they did diversify, but some of it was not uh, actually structured. So I took the real estate part and structured it and have continued it. My kids, they're interested in the, the path they've taken as in the naturopathic medicine and engineering and then real estate development or real estate, commercial real estate. And what I'm saying is, yes, follow your path. You want to work in the business. We'll look at it and see based on your career path, how that fits in to 
some other branch of the company, you know, some whether through the philanthropy foundation or whatever. So I, I don't, I'm not closing the door. I've learned from my parents. And one of the things is that um, we, we've talked about it earlier, the gender factor. Um, of course, in today's world, the new generation is not going to uh, um, sit back and allow you to uh, say, okay, it's the male that in, um, is the successor or, you know, so the male, the female, it doesn't matter. So it's important that whatever each child or each family member is doing, there are always aspects of it that you can um, tie into the business depending on how the business is structured. And, and you can also make sure that you structure it in a way that if you want, the, if the, 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 um, your children want to be part of, they show an interest in being part of the family business just because they see the value, they, because family business, it's when you have a family business, it's a unifier for the, the, the family. And so if they see that value in terms of the unifying factor, and want to be part of it, then it, you can find a way to incorporate some aspect of their own career path and in, in, um, incorporate it as part of the family business. But um, Alice, can I latch on to what um, um, Raymond is partly asking in one of his comments? Mm -hmm. So, but what do you do then? Are there some governance rules? Um, so what do you do? Uh, what do you say to a family? Uh, who says, okay, the children can join, but now you have a child that wants to join or a cousin that adds mm. absolutely no value to the business. And mm. at the end of the day, that's be, or, or how do you handle that? Are there some entry rules into the business? Definitely. Um, as with um, <laughs> as with clients that we work with, we're trying to get them into family business governance structures and basically setting up rules in terms of employment rules and and um you know we have compensation or employment and and criteria for being part of the family business and how how you come in so that criteria has to be already in place so that you use it you use it in assessing so if somebody is trying is interested in the business they have to meet that criteria and if they don't already meet it, then they have to go and get and the training. Exactly. Uh, That's so, very nicely summarized. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you so much for that. Uh, Nika uh, or Andrew, I can't remember who's first, who wants <laughs> to go first after Phyllis. Uh, maybe if I go. So um, I think everybody is so amazingly and uniquely, um, you know, created that they have different skill sets um so what what we like to consult on is to, to tell family businesses think about the concept business family mm -hmm. so what what i've seen in um in in some of our clients is that for instance the daughter went to study um become a pharmacist uh but their business and their trade is retail um and then but the, the daughter was extremely extremely successful so we try to tell the father, okay, but why don't you just, you know, buy buy a pharmacy, and and the daughter can run it, and it becomes part of the bigger family business, and that's how you diversify. Um, and at this stage, they have a whole chain of pharmacies, and and it's it's contributing a really big part of the uh, of the profits to the to the whole holding group. So that's an amazing way to diversify to actually. Yeah. Uh, follow the children's passion and what they're good at and what they went to study and what they have the yeah. skills in. Uh, so I don't think you need to diversify just for the sake of diversifying if you don't have any skills or any any know-how in, in that direction. Um, and even in the other family we worked with, uh, they are in timber. So all they knew was timber. But they saw this one family coming into onto their farm every weekend uh, because they said, no, they want to go to the certain fountain. And um, and later the one son asked, but why do you keep on going to this fountain? And then and then the people said, because it's the best water they've ever tasted. 
And then the son did a whole study and um, took the water to, to a lab and, and they tested the water. And uh, it was really pure and, and really extremely good water. Um, and he went to his father and he said, this is totally a new line that we need to start. We need to start bottling this water okay. and selling it. it said, yeah, it is, um, you know, it can be a game changer. Um, and that's, uh, I don't know if you know Thirsty in South Africa, but uh, that's the, the new brand that, that they launched. And that's also adding immense amount to their group, um, group's profits. So being open to, to the next gen, what they bring to the table, obviously with proper, proper research and, um, and studies, and also you know, looking at their passions and, and what they enjoy doing. And, and if they're good at it, why not try it? Nika? Yeah, I completely agree. Um, another area I've seen um, is next gens that are not necessarily working in the business, but looking at diversifying the capital base. So looking at um, maybe we need a liquidity event, um, maybe we can sell down in the family business and working with their parents and what do we need to do to prepare the business for a sale? How can we maximize the value of the, the enterprise? And not all families are ready to let go completely of their family businesses, but even a partial sale. And what then they often will do with that is have this liquidity event and are able to diversify in terms of their investments and move um, proceeds offshore, invest in different geographies, invest in different asset types. Um, I think, again, not all not all next gens will be necessarily the, the types that are entrepreneurial and want to work in the business. Um, but several are willing to work on the business in this way from the sidelines. Um, yo, there's so much we can talk about and our time is running out. Can I quickly um, um, perhaps start with you, Nike, uh, and address Raymond's two very, very, very good questions, but they're complex. So you can choose which one you want to answer. Um, he talks about um, in Kenya, mainly the second generations are experience a lot of sibling rivalry. It's a common topic. And just before that, he talked about um, spousal relationships that can be problematic. So, um, Nike, you, Phyllis, and then Andrea, you can perhaps choose one of them. How do one um, handle sibling rivalry? Mm -hmm. um as a current generation and as a as a sibling you know how do you handle that inside your business um starting mm -hmm. with you Nika, and then phyllis and then andrea quite often sibling rivalry is normal <laughs> at a young age particularly right um and i guess if it carries on into adulthood is to create um almost a conflict resolution policy policy is a heavy word um, but to be able to deal with issues as they come up um, and be able to invite different perspectives rather than seeing each other as enemies per se. But it's difficult to, to really know what to say in this instance. Is there a deep root um, that's at the heart of the sibling rivalry? Is it just a presenting issue where they're trying to compete for dad or mom's attention? Um, it's difficult to know, but something that I find very helpful is to work on siblings teams partnerships. So I work with siblings in during the lifetime of the founder, let's collectively as siblings start to unify and form our united identity, our common vision, our values. It helps um, for them to see themselves as on the same side rather than we're competing in some shape or form and understanding that we have this common goal to see a successful succession. That is when we all win and have this legacy that transitions. Um, in terms of legacy is about parenting. I kind of alluded to it on the question about effective stewardship. I do think legacy starts from, is, 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 is when the kids are young, you start inculcating these values, start having conversations on the meaning of money, the value of money. Um, your question, should studies deeply evaluate spouses' relationships? I, I honestly, that's a very difficult question to answer. I think it's almost an ethical one. Um, to what extent, as a, as a family business owner, would I want to be subject to a study as a parent and my spouse? 
um speaking on my behalf i wouldn't be into i would be i find that quite violating um <laughs> however i do think the point is is valid in that spousal the, the spousal the in-laws do impact on the legacy and having as a separate having including the in-laws in some capacity and the governance is important to what extent they have um, decision making power can be um, you know decided upon by the family but having a forum through which they have an opportunity to learn about the family values, the family history, the family vision, um, how the enterprise is playing out and a space and a place to air their concerns. Because quite often what happens is the next generation um, work with their parents and um, come home with all the complaints. Oh, he's too this, he's too pushy. They never listen. Oh, they prefer my brother. They never talk about the positives. <laughs> And then the spouse hears all the negatives and um, it's not coming from a bad place. It's because they love their spouse and they have a tainted view of the family and the family enterprise. And that can impact how they relate to their children and how they relate about grandpa and grandma and about this business. Right. They may make snide comments about the business and almost um dissuade the kids from getting involved in some capacity so having a forum where we can have a more balanced view and have the allow for the in-laws to air their concerns I think is really helpful in governance yeah no I agree with that it's um and it's like when my children were small I never got involved in fights so Andrea you must take some tips because they make peace after two minutes and then the parents are mad at each other. You know, you always take your child's yeah. So that's a difficult one. Phyllis, from your side? Um, uh, yes. It, 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 I think both questions are kind of tricky. But yeah. in terms of sibling, sibling rivalry, um, yes, um, I think as Nike has already alluded to, it it's usually from um, childhood um, conflicts which have uh, festered in, into adulthood. And usually there are certain triggers that uh, cause it to surface. And so it's important to find ways of getting to the root of it. And so having family meetings and so, just actually talking about some of these things, um, not in a, um, a very formal meeting setting, but uh, one of the things that happens in our family, for instance, we get together at times and we, we, we just reminisce about old times and, and some of the jokes and some of the things that happened, which for some, it may be at the time, they're looking at it, it's something that af affected them. But then when we're talking about it and somebody is then actually relating to it that this happened because of this and that, they come to realize, oh, maybe I was taking it the wrong way. Or, and, and then you're able to also you know, bring it out a bit further when, when it comes up. And that is one of the ways in which some of the tensions and the conflicts are, are diffused. But some things go so deep that it takes a lot more than you know, casual or informal settings to um, actually um, deal with. And um, some, some of it you have to basically table and, and focus on something else. And I tell clients that I've worked with, I always tell them, um, when they come at, at me basically with this person is this and this person is that, I just tell them, find the common purpose. What is your common purpose? I, I deal with real mm -hmm. estate with the with the um with with, with <clears throat> families as well. And so essentially I tell them, for instance, you're looking to you know, you've got all these properties, you've got to do something with it. So we're looking at that and trying to see how best you set it up in terms of what your parents wanted for this property or what you as a collective want to do in terms of 
um, honoring the, the, the parents with that, the legacy that is going to continue. So getting them to take their focus away from the individual mm -hmm. um, conflicts to focus on their common purpose um, always helps. And by that time, they're adults too, and they have their own families as well. So you remind them of, you know, you, ha you have an example to set for the next generation. I, that really usually, usually helps. That usually helps. Mm. When That's very difficult. good advice. Very good advice. Andrea? Um, I think I 100% agree with, with Mika and Phyllis. Um, just defining their roles. That's very important. So they need to know exactly what's their role, what they're responsible for, what they're accountable for. Um, and allowing the other sibling, you know, because everybody has different strengths and, um, you know, different talents and different things that they're good at. And in, in your adulthood to actually be able to stand back and say, okay, I appreciate that. Yes, that you are stronger in this, this area, but I'm stronger in that area. But together, we're actually, you know, stronger together. Um, so touching on that unified goal, that unified legacy, that unified we're doing this for our children and we're building something bigger and greater together uh, for the next generations to come. Um, and, you know, some families, they do break or the one son because it's more pertinent in the males um, because males are. This is a generalization, but they tend to fight more for the power. And I want to be the CEO or the MD and I want to lead and you need to listen to me, et cetera. Um, but if they can focus on, OK, you're good at this and I'm good at that. And if we disagree in our opinions, it's not necessarily bad because we will get a better solutions because we're, we're two people, three people, siblings that's working um, towards uh, uh, the common goal. Okay, we have two minutes. We have two minutes left, and I uh, want to ask Phyllis, starting with you, and then you can also quickly say what you want to comment. All right. What is the one lesson that you will say to a twenty-five-year version of yourself uh, as the next gen? So, if you put yourself in the shoes and you were twenty-five years now as the next gen, what would the one thing, perhaps on a lighter note? Um, my advice would be don't sweat the small stuff. I am very good at wasting a lot of energy on sweating the small stuff. So that is my advice. So Phyllis, if we can start with you, one lesson that you will um, give the 25-year version of yourself. Uh, I think um, a big one is this too shall pass. You know, it, it, nothing lasts forever. So um when you're feeling like something is so overwhelming and and or someone is upsetting you to the point where you you're about to lose your your mind uh, it's just as they always uh, tell you count to 10 and this too shall pass that's just fantastic fun. and i will write this up because i think there's so many jewels in this conversation thank you so much uh, nikai and then Andrea? Um, don't fear failure. There's no such thing as failure. That's only an opportunity to learn. Um, at age 25, I was very, very just worried about how I was perceived and whether yeah. I was feasting it, whether my family business was doing well. And it was just emotionally very, very difficult. And if yeah. I had reframed it to, it's just an opportunity to learn, it would have been really helpful. Very good advice. Andrea? Um, yes, I think I want to add to that. Um, and also to, to remain humble. Um, when you grow up, you're trying to fight for your place in the sun and, you know, what you're good at and stand out. Um, but being humble and open to learn and listen to other people's opinions and, um, and their advice and the parents' advice. Um you know, receiving it, really taking it to heart and really listening. <laughs> That's sometimes hard and, to really, really listen. And don't really be a know-it-all. <laughs> and don't be a know-it-all. <laughs> yeah. Listen, ladies, uh, I want to, uh, and also the audience, I really want to applaud you. It's been fascinating. I've learned so much. I've made notes here. 
that I will definitely summarize. And uh, it's a privilege to be with uh, all of you on this one platform. Thank you so, so much. And may the future just bring so many more wonderful things. Um, and thank you for the wisdom that you have willing to share with us. It's been fantastic. So thank you so much. And I don't think uh, Titi is um, currently here, but uh, I also want to thank her and Hayden for the organization and also Shelly uh, for always being such a wonderful team member and Nika, you as well. Uh, but also the ladies currently this afternoon. Um, it's been fantastic and I've learned so much. And also thank you to the audience members who have been uh, listening, you know, the two days. And yeah, have a lovely evening. And um, I'm going to have a cup of tea now. <laughs> <laughs> thank, thank you, everyone. Thank you so much, really everyone. Bye. Bye-bye.